I mean, like, tell us briefly about your childhood. Yeah. So, I'm a Kathmandu, you know, born in Kathmandu. My surname, uh, you'll find it quite interesting that, you know, in the West, you'll have people whose surnames are like Schumacher, but they don't make shoes anymore. So here, if you're a Tamrakar or a Chitrakar, so like me, I'm a Chitrakar, I was born in an artisan family. But my family has two, you know, sort of uh, big changes in their life. One was in 1850, you know, our grandparents traveled to England in 1850 uh, to oil paint the visit but they brought a camera back so okay. photography became something that the family you know took on very early on but the second part was my grandfather was very sure that education was the only thing that would you know really bring changes so a i was born in an artisan family a very traditional Kathmandu family and yet you know i went to a jesuit school okay. then i studied science physics mm -hmm. uh, went to india you know did my engineering then I went to the University of Pennsylvania in the United States okay. and studied energy planning. So, uh, so half of me is very traditional, very local, and the other half, I guess, is the best of both worlds. Tell us a little about your school and college life. Yeah. Um, how how your school was, how you were in your school life. Mm -hmm. So, it, so being a you know, local kid in a Jesuit school wasn't easy. You know? So, basically, you know, can you believe that? I learned my first Nepali word when I was eight years old. Okay. So, which is not an easy thing. Uh, but then, you know, this goes on and on, right? So, when I went to India to study, you know, in a time when India was extremely competitive, and so having been educated in Ash College, or Amrit Science College, you went. So, one thing that I understood very early on was that this is a meritocracy, mm -hmm. that the only way I can prove myself is to work hard. So, whether it was sports, whether it was, you know, academic, whether it was anything, so you really worked hard because you knew that without the hard work you could never you know catch up so i think because of that you know i made it through the school system very well uh, in college also you know balancing against sports extracurricular activities and academics so it's hard to tell people now you know how these things work but in those days you know going to india we could easily compete with any indian student uh, in, in an engineering college so we did very well so came back and then of course in those days not too much competition you had a ready made job waiting for you here. I worked for the Academy of Science and Technology uh, and then, you know, of course, the Cold War was a big benefit for Nepalese because half of the people were being sent to the Soviet Union and the other half was being sent to the United States. Yeah. I happened to be one of those people who went to the United States. So, in terms of the hard work, I think, you know, it's, a, it's, it's quite a, a story of, you know, working through the system. But then the message that I think all of us have to understand is that hard work does pay. So, the reason why we are where we are today is you know, you really focus on the academics, you really focus on the sports, you really focus on the extracurriculars, mm -hmm. and then, you know, nothing besides that, you know, it was a very focused uh, life at the time. Okay. Um, now tell us uh, a little about your interest in Nepalese uh, art and history. Right. So, you know, we always talk about, you know, the world, we talk about, you know, places, we talk about things. So, for example, let's take the life of the Buddha. Okay? So, the Buddha was born here. Mm -hmm. And he basically lived a life of 29 years. And then in a six years he meditated. And then 45 years he taught. Okay, so it's a simple way to look at the life of the Buddha. So my family, you know, as one of the artisan families, basically has been painting his life for centuries and centuries. Okay. Right? To a point where, you know, they painted for Kublai Khan, they painted for the Tibetan emperor, or they painted for everybody. So this is something that we the family. But today if you ask a young person to depict or try to explain what those paintings mean, you'll be quite surprised how little they can actually explain what they're painting. So what we have to really understand, and this is how I got interested in art, was that the tangible, whether it's art, whether it's a structure, whether it's a temple, whether it's an icon, so that's easy, because that's the tangible. So you can copy a painting. But what is really tough is the intangible, to actually understand why is this painting being painted over and over and over again. So. The point about you know being culturally interested is always being able to say why are we doing this for thousands of years. So the Buddha lived 2,600 years ago, mm -hmm. but to be able to explain today why you know that particular piece of art is significant, and so I think every Nepali, every you know, person in the world, I think understands that the tangible is actually cheap because the painting is basically bought you know based on you know how many days you worked and how much paint you spent it on it. Mm -hmm. But if you can explain the intangible, what that painting means, mm -hmm. then it's worth millions. Sure. And so what I've always focused on is the intangible. So okay. whether it's Lumini, whether it's restoring pattern, mm -hmm. whether it's rebuilding Bhaktapur, 
Mm -hmm. Always focus on the intangible. Okay, um, because we um, talked about, just like um, touched upon rebuilding part yeah. before, I just wanted to ask you a little about your restoration yeah. um, projects and then um, how was it working in Kathmandu and Lumbini? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as an engineer, so this is my engineering hat also, so we really have to understand that human beings love logic. Okay? So if we present logic in a proper way, mm -hmm. then you can really mobilize people. So for example, you know, a really good example would be Bandipur. In the middle of the conflict, we restored Bandipur mm -hmm. with the help of the European Union. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, Bhaktapur, when, at a time when, say, you could rent a store in Bhaktapur for 400 rupees a day. Okay. And everybody was basically selling their property and leaving Bhaktapur. Mm -hmm. Patan, so when Bekharatna became the mayor, you know, people basically wanted to destroy the heritage, the square, so that they could build a highway connecting Baneswar and Patan. Okay. So that vehicles will go through. Mm -hmm. Our Kathmandu, you know, the, the, if you see the stone paving and all the underground, mm -hmm. so the challenges are there. You know, on the day we basically enforced the building height for Bauda, mm -hmm. can you imagine we took 400 riot police oh my God. just to enforce the building height? Mm -hmm. you know? So people have forgotten these things, but let me tell you why these things work and how we do it. So, livability is the first thing that people understand. You know, that I'm living in a historical city, the city should be livable. You know? mm -hmm. So my drain should work, my garbage should be picked up. Mm -hmm. But livability is a function of management. Mm -hmm. And in this country, we really undermine management. You know? Unless you have management, the city starts being livable. Mm -hmm. Then you say, how do you pay for management? So you have to then look at the bankability. Mm -hmm. The site has to be bankable. Mm -hmm. But that bankability comes from a feature of that which makes it competitive. Mm -hmm. okay? mm -hmm. So Bandipur has this competitiveness, Bhaktapur has this competitiveness. You know? So each of these sites has this competitiveness. Mm -hmm. But the framework with which you use, from the competitiveness, you get to the bankability. From the bankability, you get to the management. Mm -hmm. And then the management basically gives local people livability. Mm -hmm. And only then can you get the population on your side to basically restore it. Now, having said that, once people are interested, they already have the skills. They have the documentation. Sure. So it's usually about resources. But believe me, you know, uh, we live in a country where the one thing that nobody has to worry about really is resources. Mm -hmm. So today, if you look at the newspapers, all the money that has come into Nepal, only 15% has been dispersed. Okay. So this is what we struggle with. Mm -hmm. We are not able to spend 85% of the money that we have. Yeah. So the banks are stuck you know, with all this money. Individuals are stuck. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the donors are all stuck. So I don't think resources are the issue. But getting this framework correct is the real issue. So whether it's Lumini, whether it's Bhaktapur, whether it's Patan, you can use the more or less a genetic framework like that. Okay. Now, um, I'd like to ask you about a journey now, now that you are mm -hmm. uh, an established uh, architectural mm -hmm. heritage expert as well as a cultural historian. Mm -hmm. How did it come about? How was the journey? So, you know, although I, I just said, you know, trained as an engineer and, you know, take that path, so I do a lot of developmental work. Sure. Now, in developmental work, what we really have to understand is that technology mm -hmm. is very often the easy part. Right? Technology means A, B, wires, you know, mm -hmm. so that's simple. The biggest variable in applying any of those principles is people. Sure. So people becomes the biggest variable. Mm -hmm. So when you try to understand people, so for example, many years ago, I've been working in Mustang, say 25, 30 years ago. And when you explain to the people during the day that we're going to build a small hydro plant here, Mm -hmm. So everybody says yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. But in the evening when they drink a little bit and become a little stronger, they come, came to me and said, you know, how can you get electricity out of water? So which is quite difficult to answer. Mm -hmm. But secondly, mm -hmm. if you take electricity or the Nepali Urza from the Pani, mm -hmm. will my rice still grow? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Pani Bada Urza Dan Sure. So you see how people become the biggest variable. Mm -hmm. The technology is simple. So like, look at the vehicles here, look at the road here. It's people that is the biggest vehicle. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you really have to understand in development is that culture and the way people think, the way people organize themselves is the key variable in Nepal. Mm -hmm. So having said that, if you say, okay, we really have to you know, work on, say, population one. It's a developmental goal. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, if you look at why does Nepal have such a huge population growth rate 20 years ago, it was 2.6%. Okay. Okay. So you have to understand that the reason why a family is having eight children mm -hmm. is because they are not sure if they will live. Uh, sure. Okay. So you have a lot of children because they might die. Mm -hmm. If you understand that, you say, okay, we have to basically provide them clean water. 
because eighty percent of those deaths are because of polluted water. So having worked on clean water and sanitation for twenty years, so look at the data. Two point six percent growth rate twenty years ago, two point one percent growth rate ten years ago, and right now it is one point four percent. One point four percent growth rate in population means we actually have a negative growth. You know, show me one country in the world that has actually attained negative population growth rate by understanding. You know what the variables are. So the reason why you get interested in culture is no matter what you are trying to attain, it is built on that cultural backdrop. And the sooner you understand that, the you can. So when we created Chitur National Park, when we created the Anupurna Conservation Area, when we created the mountain, you know, the Makalaporu, all of these initiatives are based on understanding the local people and their culture. So Bhaktapur, Patan, Lumbini doesn't really matter. Because the technology, the developmental investments, that's the easy part. Because those are more like A, B, C kind of solutions. But if you don't understand the local people and their culture, it cannot happen. So just give you a very simple example. So every year in the month of June, the water table in the valley will get to the lowest, and on that day we have a festival, and the festival is dedicated to cleaning the wells. So when you go to clean the wells, on the side of the well, there is a snake, a naga. And so you are supposed to appease the snake gods before you clean the well. Mm -hmm. So you light a lamp and you set it down. Okay. And if the light goes off, you say the snake gods are angry. So you and me as development people, we have to understand that that is the simple flame test for carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. So all of us have done flame test in the chemistry lab. Yeah. But then there is this cultural aspects of nagas and there is a flame test which is chemistry. Yeah. So I think if you can understand these things, then people don't die sure. while cleaning the wells. So, if we understand these things about human nature, about our communities, about our societies, then the success rate is much higher. But if you introduce any technology, any solution, any money in isolation, then it doesn't work. So, the the, the short answer to your question is that without understanding the cultural base, you know, half of the changes we seek will never happen, and so we are wasting a lot of resources because okay. it's in isolation. Because you touched upon um, working for Makalu mm -hmm. and all those conservation areas, yeah. um, what uh, what inspires you to associate with all these um, environmental groups and all these uh, yeah. changes that's happening? So, like I said, you know, so if you take a country of you know now we are twenty six point six million, mm -hmm. uh, and then you know we are a world of seven billion people, and it's a it's a huge number. Mm -hmm. But every day, if you can remind yourself about how lucky we are. Mm -hmm. And so, with my education, with my background, I started working in rural Nepal. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, in Dang Valley, I remember maybe 27, 28 years ago, I was installing a solar drinking water project. Can you imagine? 27 years ago. So, can you imagine that before we installed this technology, the women would basically tie their children, tie their children to the post, okay. so that they could go and fetch water. So, as somebody who is as privileged as me, to look at that and not get affected. You know, that would be really sad, eh? sure. and so what does it take to change that? You know, butcher like this, and a panel in the You know, for me it was just intolerable. Eh? So you knew that you know there is a simple technology to pump the water, mm -hmm. but like I said, you have to again intervene mm -hmm. with a very specific knowledge of how that community, you know, the cultural aspects and all that. Mm -hmm. So if you are of a person who basically says, you know, it's not enough, it's not enough, my husband put gas there is no end to this. Yeah. But the Buddhist text is very specific that you know so you know in the all the, the Mahayana text. Mm -hmm. So once you reach a stage in your life mm -hmm. where you know that you can go on mm -hmm. and you can go on, but you actually stop and you turn around mm -hmm. to bring everybody along. Mm -hmm. So this is what we call Mahayana, you know, the higher vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know people a lot of people in the world, not just me or anybody, there a lot of people aspire to stop and to go back. And so I think you know if you're affected by this, so you can say the Buddha was affected by four sightings. Eh? So one he saw an old person, mm -hmm. he saw a sick person, and he saw a dead person. Mm -hmm. And so he was affected, and so he went back. Yeah. So you can say, you know, I was affected by the sight of mm -hmm. these children. I was affected, you know, when I went to the Manaslu area. Mm -hmm. I just could not imagine that people felt that children falling off the road was something natural. Mm -hmm. You know, the infrastructure was so bad. Yeah. Or people might say, Jumalama, you know, they actually hid the stone. Mm -hmm. And they put the mustard seeds and squeeze the oil out. Okay. And therefore, that was the most natural thing that women should be doing. Mm -hmm. And so you walk in there and say, it doesn't have to be that way. I can put a simple technology to change it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it takes a very strong you know, value base. But once you have that value base, mm 
then I think you start recognizing all these things as opportunities. Mm -hmm. But then also you need a little bit of you know problem solving knack. Mm -hmm. Because you know people will try and then they'll stop. And so stopping isn't the solution either. Mm -hmm. So today, you know, when you tell the world more than twenty percent of Nepal is protected areas. Mm -hmm. And then fourteen percent of Nepal is community forestry. Mm -hmm. So that didn't happen by chance. Sure. It took a lot of work in those days. Um, to wind it all up, uh, since you are an inspiration for many, um, what message do you have for the rest of the Nepalese and especially the youngsters? Mm. So, you know, in terms of you know what we have to really uh, you know get across mm -hmm. is that people have right the skills, you know, the aspirations, the goals, because I think human beings in general are not different. More or more or less, all of us aspire for the same things. Mm. Okay, mm. but we come from a you know cultural or a historical background where we basically we've been told mm. that you cannot. So mm. if you look at our literature also, we always start a proposal by saying Nepal is a small, poor, landlocked country. Mm. Okay. Mm. So the message has to be, you know, none of those things are true. So we are not poor; we are poorly managed. So look at the distinction between saying it's a poor country versus a poorly managed country. Mm -hmm. Use shift, you know, paradigm mm -hmm. shift. Mm -hmm. So do we say we are a landlocked country or do we say we are a land-linked country? Mm -hmm. Because we have two billion people to the left and the right. How are we landlocked? We are land-linked. Mm -hmm. So you see how the semantics changes. Mm -hmm. So small, 80% of the UN members have population smaller than Nepal. How are we small? Okay, but if you are constantly being told throughout your life we are poor, we are small, we are landlocked, so you become fatalistic once, right? fatalistic. Mm -hmm. You say kyun, so kyun hota nahi. So I think the message that we have to really get across to the young people is that first of all start changing your semantics, because the words are the first things that create images in your mind. Mm -hmm. So if I can keep on telling you, look, you are, you know, this. Good, if you start using good words, mm -hmm. so those images stay in your mind. But if you always start with these three bad words, what kind of image do we create? Mm -hmm. So I would just say, you know, if you change your circle, if you change your educational background, if you change your, you know, readings a little bit, mm -hmm. and start focusing on these more, you know, sort of uh, proactive mm -hmm. words, semantics, you know, thinking, mm -hmm. then you know everything is possible. So the possibilities will come from a change in that conversation. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. And um, because uh, Sunil, she told you a little about Nepal, so yeah. about our initiative, it's a tourism portal. Sure. Um, how, how do you find the whole idea? Do you have any suggestions for us? Yeah. So first of all, mm -hmm. I'm one of those people who is not going to leave this place. Mm -hmm. Okay. So whether this country goes down the drain or you know becomes mm -hmm. better, I'll be right here. So mm -hmm. having said that, this is home. Mm -hmm. And so the message that we have to really send home is that we would like to invite a lot of people to our home. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, we need a vehicle. And so I think what I was shown mm -hmm. is basically a vehicle that will basically allow people mm -hmm. to come to Nepal mm -hmm. and enjoy it. Now in the process, those visitors will both become an end mm -hmm. because they'll bring money, mm -hmm. but they'll also become a means. Mm -hmm. As a means, they will also help us solve you know, some of the challenges that we have. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, why am I willing to be part of the Great Himalayan Trail? Mm -hmm. A, we would like to connect all the villages that are the front line of the glaciers and the water sources. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately when one billion people get affected downstream, there are those are the communities that we'll have to work with. Mm -hmm. But secondly, we would like to also connect them mm -hmm. so that they become resilient to change. Mm -hmm. But then if you say, how are we going to pay for one and two, it will be tourism. Mm -hmm. And so tourism will then help us to pay for those two. So I understand you know, how you know, these things can be possible. Mm -hmm. But also it's a country where you know, we don't have too much leadership. Right? We have a lot of followers, but we don't have leaders. Mm -hmm. And so it is very important that people who can, who are credible, mm -hmm. and who have that ability must really step up you know, to do these things. Mm -hmm. So the vehicle that is needed to attend that, mm -hmm. you know, the Nepal Sutra can be one of those vehicles because mm -hmm. it, it reaches out to those people. If you can be very clear on the message, mm -hmm. they will want to get back. Mm -hmm. And so if you create this two-way you know, street, mm -hmm. then I think anything we aspire for mm -hmm. you know, can be done. So I was very impressed with you know, the short demonstration I just called. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anindra, for talking yeah. to us. Nepal Sutra, Sapai Kura Nepali.